What a wonderful song. Hey, one day we're going home. And uh, wicked as this place is, today would be a good day for an airlift. Amen. So you believe that? I'll tell you this. If I didn't believe it, I'd have quit a long time ago. Amen. It's not, if you, if you don't really believe it, we're talking to the teen class today about uh, trust and believing and courage. And I said, uh, uh, what is believing? What is really, and of course they gave great answers and they knew exactly what believing or trusting was. And I said, how, how do you prove that you believe something? And they kind of looked, and I said, well, think about this. If you were on top of the building, and the building was on fire, and we told you to jump, we've got, we've got one of those airbags here. Uh, you got a choice to make. You can stand up on this roof, take a chance of getting burned and die, or you can trust that someone knows what they're talking about and jump on that airbag and trust it's going to save you. That's your choices. You, you prove that you trust by doing something, right? And I think that sometimes we talk about how we trust the Lord, but then when we have to trust the Lord, we don't trust the Lord, right? And, and so if, if, if what he's saying about, right, sometimes we, we, we're, in, we're in a joyful mood and everything's going good, we want to praise the Lord. Because that's what, that's what singing is, it's a form of worship and praise. should be. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's more about our flesh and what we like instead of, you know, and people say, well, I like this kind of music because it, it ministers to me. Well, the, the primary purpose of music is worship to him, yes, right? Now, if the, if the uh, uh, benefit to you is you get blessed off of it, great. But, but the primary thing is worship. Yes. And so uh, if you can only sing when things are good, if you can only worship God when things are good, then you'll never worship God. And I appreciate the good singing, appreciate you being here. Won't you turn to Romans 5, if you would, with me. We want to look at the first five verses of Romans chapter 5. And uh, hard to believe we are in the month of October, a couple more months left in this year. Now, uh, people say all the time, well, you know, if you don't, if 2024 was not a good year, you just got a couple months, it's 2025. Let me help you with something. Just because that thing clicks to January 1 doesn't mean anything's going to change if you don't change. Right? And so you, you better determine now that, uh, that you want to, uh, things to change in your life. Uh, and so uh, we're looking at uh, a couple more months in this, in this particular year. But uh, I wouldn't wait. I believe if I wasn't right with God, I'd get right this morning. I believe if I wasn't saved, I believe before I walked out of here, I'd, I'd get saved. I'd know where I was going to spend eternity. And uh, if I had all against my brother, I'd fix it today. See, we're, we're, we're in the last days of the last days. And uh, you can't look this world and not think that Jesus is coming back. And if he comes today, there's no second chance to fix things. And so when we get to Romans chapter 5, uh, we, need to, we actually need to go back a little bit. And I'm going to share this with you. Because here's the thing. When you study your Bible... Understand that Romans is a letter, right? In other words, Paul didn't write it in chapter form, uh, so it, it just keeps building. So if you go back to chapter 4, uh, the Bible said in verse 21, being fully persuaded that he had promised, uh, what he had promised he was able also to perform. Well, that's, that's a pretty basic element. If, if you don't believe what someone promises they can do it, then you won't trust them, right? Right? I mean, half what I see on the political stuff, I don't trust any of them, right? And I, 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 it's been encouraging, Brother Ford, to see uh, folks, just regular folks, getting involved and saying, we're going to take care of this problem because I know this, uh, those, uh, those birds that uh, uh, politicians ain't going to fix nothing. So he goes on to say uh, in verse 22, therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. So the, the, the word imputed really means that it was placed on him. So again, we go back here and uh, we're talking about uh, in chapter 4, uh, Abraham. And so it says here that he, f he was pr fully persuaded that what God promised he would perform. So remember the story. Not only did he leave his country, he took his son, took him on the altar and was going to sacrifice him because God promised that through his son, 
uh, with all the nations, there would there'd be a multitude of people uh, born, right? So he knew that God had promised that this was the promised child, so he had to do something. And so the Bible said it was imputed. In other words, it was counted. His righteousness was counted in the fact that he believed what God said. Well, you go to the New Testament, and the Bible said, uh, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So anything, any way you look at it, it takes faith to be saved. It takes faith to please God. So it says in verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. Right, If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So here's what he's saying. He said, okay, this same God that promised Abraham is the same God that's promising us. Same God that raised up Jesus from the dead. And because he imputed righteousness and justification on Abraham, he will also give it to us. Here's the problem. There's something we got to do. In other words, everybody's not getting this justification. Everybody's not being saved. Everybody's not going to heaven. Right? So we come to verse 1 of chapter 5. Uh, the Bible said, therefore. When we see that word, we have to say, what's it there for? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. Notice the words there, being justified by what? Faith. We have access by what? Faith. Into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. There's a lot of people here this morning, you're going through some tribulations, some trials, right? Those, those are normal. Believe it or not, those are normal. You're going through trials and things in your life. You're going, I, well, according to the Bible, the Bible said not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So I want to I share with you this security of being saved. In other words, isn't it good to know that, that you can know that you're on your way to heaven this morning? There's some folks don't know that, right? They're, 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 they're trusting on their works or their baptism or their catechism or their, something they've done. But according to what the Bible said, and that's all I'm going, I'm not arguing denominational stuff. I'm not arguing theological. I'm just going on what the Bible said. The Bible used the example of Abraham who trusted God to do what he'd said, he said he would do. And the Bible said it was imputed, uh, in, uh, imputed on him uh, righteousness. And so therefore, same, same today, Brother Barry, we have to trust what God said. That's not about how you feel or what you think. It's about what God said and whether or not you believe it. So uh, since salvation is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ... That's not a Baptist doctrine. See, I hate to even have to say this today, Brother Floyd, but we're at a place where you have to distinguish because there's so much division among God's people that you have to say this is not a Baptist doctrine. It's not a Methodist, Pentecost. It's a Bible doctrine that the Bible says here that uh, salvation is based on the finished work of Christ. Not on Mary. It's on Jesus, right? So, so we're, we're trusting on what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary for our salvation. Not my baptism, not shaking the hands of the preacher, not good outweighs. See, all those are lies. All those are worse. My good outweighs my bad. I dress right, have the right haircut. None of that matters. What matters is, has there ever been a time in your life where you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior? So it's not an intellectual, it's not emotional, it's not occupational. It's based on what Christ did and the fact that God is satisfied with it. You Listen, folks, you cannot do enough good to get to heaven. We were talking about this in Sunday school. People say, you know, look at, look at all the good people that are donating to this cause. No, listen to what I'm saying. The Bible said there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none good. Now, what they're doing are good acts, right? Bad people can do good things. 
right? So, so it's not about the act. It's about the character inside. It's about what we're made up of. And the Bible said there is none righteous, no, not one. So I'm thankful for all. Listen, we're all sinners. We're either saved sinners or we're lost sinners. It's not good and bad. It's saved and lost. So there are people that, listen, uh, their, their heart strings are tugged, and, and that's a good thing, right? And they've donated and they've helped, but then, then guess what? Saturday night they're all uh, carousing and uh, committing, uh, unpar- uh, they're committing sin and out drinking and partying. Well, you can't tell me, you say, well, they're good because they gave to that. So God's going to look at them and say, well, they, gave to a, they donated to a cause, and so therefore he's going to let them in. No, no, you're forgetting this side. And, and that's the human nature. We're all that way, right? Your good will never outweigh your bad. If you're dependent on good outweighing bad, you're sunk, friend. Because the Bible said we're already condemned. It's not one day God's going to weigh the scales. He's already weighed the scales and said that, that it is appointed unto man once to die. There is, a, there is a judgment coming if you're not a Christian. It's, you say, well, God, God is a mean God. No, no. See, you are already going there. God is a loving and gracious God because he's trying to rescue from going there. So, so it's based on what Christ did, not what we do or what we will do. Right? That's, that's, listen, folks, that's what it's all about, Jesus. So two things he deals with in verse 1 and 2. He deals with our standing. Now notice the difference here. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, we, uh, by whom also we have access by faith in this grace, wherein he stand, uh, we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So therefore, the Bible said in verse 1, being justified. It's already happened. It's already been taken care of. That's past tense, hallelujah. That's what took place on the cross. When Jesus died as you and for you, he justified you in the sight of God. So today our standing does not change. Amen. If you're truly born again, you're always going to be born again. Now again, let me say this. Time out. I ain't talking about some little shallow prayer you said when you were eight years old and nothing's ever changed. I'm talking about when you truly get born again, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in you and it changes who you are. I didn't say you never sin, but may I say you're not the same as what you used to be. The Bible said, and such were some of you. It doesn't say such are some of you. So our number one is our standing, and in that we see our acceptance with God. Now let me say this again. You're not accepted by God because of how good you are. And you're not accepted by God because you got baptized or you got christened or you ate communion wafers or what. Listen, your acceptance with a thrice holy God is based on the justification and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So because of the finished work of Christ, we can be sure of our standing with God. God ain't looking at me today saying, you know what, I think I'm going to let you in today because you're a preacher. Nope, he's not looking at you today and saying, I think I'm going to let you in today because you got dunked under the water. I, I'm, I'm going to let you in today because your good outweighs your bad. No, no, see, he's looking on the hands, he's looking on the, the, the handprints of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's looking over on that mercy seat and seeing the blood of Jesus and saying, I, you're accepted this morning, friend, because of what he did 2,000 years ago. You're accepted because Jesus is accepted of, of the Father. See, we're justified, our sins are gone. See, we make so much, friend, and, and I've said this, we, we make so much of the forgiveness of God. That's, right. That's all we talk about, Brother R.J. Well, he's forgiven us of our sins. Great. But see, you're st- you can forgive somebody and they're still guilty. Right. Brother Bart, if I offend you and you say, you know what, I forgive you. Thank God you restored the fellowship, but I still did what you said I did. Right? Right? If by chance I owe something for the sin I commit or the crime I commit, the fact that the the judge says, well, it's forgiven, does not mean I'm still not guilty of that very thing. But to be justified means that my record has been erased. Forgiven means it's been 
It's uh, the punishment has not been given to me, right? Justified means it's gone. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to tell you something this morning. Listen to me. You can have some peace with God if you'll realize that, that God has chosen not to bring your sin back up. Amen. The devil will. He's the accuser of the brethren. Your flesh will. Your mind will. But may I say when God deals with your sin, he does all things well. He doesn't do it 90%, 95%. When he saved you and justified you, he said, I am choose not to remember that anymore. It's behind me. Amen. What, what to God we'd get like that towards each other once in a while. Amen. You offended me. I'm sorry. Sounds good. Let's move on. Amen. Instead of, well, I don't think they were serious enough when they apologized. See, part of the problem we have in this world, everybody thinks they know what somebody else is thinking. So we have peace with God. We're justified. Our sins are gone. Listen, they're washed away. God, God took that blood. Man, when he, he's like, come here, boy. Let me, let, me, let me mark it. Let me deal with that sin. He didn't cover it. Hallelujah. He washed it away. And so he has something the world can't give. And so therefore if he gave it, the world can't take it away. You can have peace. Listen, I know it's kind of an oxymoron and kind of uh, anti uh, our mindset. But you can have peace with God amidst the storm. Well, you don't know what you're talking about, preacher. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So our ex- I'm accepted. I, Brother Junior, I've been invited into royalty. Hallelujah. Man, I feel royal today, don't you? Amen. I mean, listen, if you were, a ch- if you were really a child of a king, Brother Marty, if you were born into the royal family of England or whatever, they would, they would, they would train you up to act a certain way. They would train you up. You would have access to things that no one else would have access to. Can we agree with that? Well, may I say when you got born again, when you got saved, when you asked Jesus to be your Savior, may I say he brought you into the family of God. He brought you into the family of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you've got access to stuff the King of England doesn't have. So stop living below your privilege. Stop living like a pauper. Stop living like a nobody. And realize you're a child of God, a child of the King. And even though you go through some trials, you've got a God in heaven that loves you. You've got a God in heaven that wants to save you, that wants to take care of you. And all the graces of God are accessible to you and you're accepted in in the beloved. So we have acceptance of God and then we have access. So in verse 1, we're justified by faith. We have peace with God. Notice this, through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's your acceptance. But verse 2 gives us our access. He says, by whom also we have access by faith. So our justification is by faith. Listen, you've never laid your eyes on Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that? Do you realize if you're not operating in the faith realm, what we're doing today is absolutely ludicrous? You, You see what I'm saying? This doesn't make any sense. It, listen, if you just came here today because you're feeling bad about yourself and you wanted to... F- See, that's the problem, Brother Shane. Most of what we're doing among Christianity, we're trying to put band-aids on people's problems so they'll come to church and feel better when they walk out. We'll give them some speech or some pep talk that's not spiritual, that's not biblical. It's some TED talk and they walk out and go, Whew, I feel better. And then they walk out there and they they face the devil and they face all of hell and they face everything this world throws at them and they're right back in the same boat. And it's it's a pop culture Christianity that has absolutely no teeth and no meat Praise God. And it's up and down, back and forth, in and out. Every time the wind blows a certain way, we're going that way. I'm saying that when you realize that you're accepted in the beloved and that uh, that we have access, we're accepted and we have access, and both of them are by faith. You can't please God without faith. You can't be saved without faith. You cannot have the blessings and promises of God without faith. So if you're not operating in faith this morning, may I say, 
Stop looking and operating by what you see and start operating by what the Word of God says. And by the way, may I say this, that years ago everybody thought we were a bunch of kooks and quacks because we believe this book and now prophetically everything this book says would come to pass is starting to come to pass. Amen. Amen. You don't understand all the, the kings of the east and the, the, the bear of the north and all that. Well, let me tell you exactly what's happening right now. Israel, they all want to blow up Israel. They hate the Jew. They always have hated the Jews. Iran's launching missiles in on them. Now you see Russia and China who have not typically been on the same side. They're lock, uh, locking up together. They're providing all this money, all this weaponry, all three of them. North Korea, the same thing. And they're all going after Israel. And we got a bunch of jack legs in Washington that what they ought to do is get them a Bible and realize that if we don't stand on the side of Israel, you we're done. We're done. Right? And so you look at, and by the way, I talked to Jay Ross this week. He's, he's our missionary. He's my friend. He lives in Israel. I said, brother, I was thinking about you today. That, that's when they launched those uh, 200 ballistic missiles uh, in on Israel. I said, brother, I was thinking about you today. I want to call and see how you're doing. He said, we're fine. I said, okay. He said, it's only 200 missiles. We ain't worried about that. I thought. <laughs> it's only 200 missiles. We're not really that worried about that. I thought. How, how comfortable are we here? Right? right. Yes, sir. I'm telling you what, man. That blew my mind. I, I got off the phone with him, and I'm thinking, this guy's crazy. <laughs> but it's a way of life. That's right. See, we have access through faith. What's that mean? We have the enjoyment of his grace. His grace is his unmerited favor. Right. Listen, it may not be that you've always got a lot of money in your bank account, but you can enjoy the grace of God. You may not always have great health, but you can enjoy the grace of Anything God gives you is His grace. You don't have a million dollars, praise God, you got food in the cupboard. Like I said, all you, all you got to do is look at some other people in this world, and you'll realize that where you are, a lot of people love to have what you got. There's... <laughs> Hey, there's a lot of people in those mountains right now. They'd like to be in church this morning. They'd like to be in air condition. They'd like to be in a padded pew somewhere. Praise God. You know what they're doing? Trying to find food. Trying to find loved ones that, that swept off by the river. I don't want to hear no complaining, praise God. What you got, you ought to thank God for. See, we have access to the grace of God by faith. Now we're his children. We're his children. My children have access, much as I'll let them have, right, to everything I got. There'll be one day, uh, you know, me and Miss Ellen be gone, and everything we've ever had is going to be, I don't know if I'm going to give it to them or not. <laughs> Miss Vine, now I got grandbaby. I got a grandbaby and going to have some more coming. I know I'm, gonna have, I'm probably going to have 15, 20 grandchildren. I might just pass it on down to them. They might need it. Amen. But he invites us into his presence, right? We have access to him. I can, go, I can go to him right now. He's my, he's my daddy. I can go to him right now. I can get on that altar, bow my head, and say, Daddy, well, I need to talk to you about something. Our standing. We have standing with a thrice holy God before, because of the finished work of Christ. And then number two is our state. Look at verse three. Standing and state are two different things. Bible said, not only so, so he said, not only do you have that, so I'm secure in my standing with God. That ain't changing, right? I'm as saved as I'm ever going to be, hallelujah. I'm as good as in heaven when it's my standing. It's settled. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But now he deals with where we're living at. He said, not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Right. Well, you can't glory in tribulation if you don't know you're standing. Right. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh 
Not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Right. Now notice, you, you better pay attention there. Because he says here, we glory in tribulation. Automatically your sin can't do that, preacher. Knowing, well how do you know? Because his word says it. You won't feel that, you will not feel that tribulation worth the patience. Right? That's why you can't operate by feeling. You won't, none of this makes sense to our emotion. So he says this, you got to, he said, we glory in tribulation, knowing. Well, how do you know something? It's in your intellect. It's in your being. It's not in your emotion. You don't know things by emotion. You know things by by faith, right? But John, I don't always feel saved. I mean, there's times I'll sin, Brother Eddie, and I'll go, that was stupid. And the devil say, if you saved, you wouldn't have done that. Well, I got to go back to the Word of God. There's sometimes I got to go back to the Word of God and say, I'm saved because of this, right? Not how I feel. So there's times I go through tribulation. I'm going, there's no way this makes sense. There, in my emotion, there's no way any of this makes sense because I don't, watch this, I don't feel, right? Everything in this world now is about how you feel. I don't feel saved. I don't feel loved. I don't feel like you respect me. I don't feel. You, you better quit operating. I'm glad we got emotions, but you can't operate off emotions. Your emotions can be wrong. Right? They can. Patience, experience, experience, hope. So knowing that tribulation works patience, patience, experience, experience, hope. And, right, hope maketh not a shame. Well, look what he tells us. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Well, how's that? By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto you. So God said, listen, I want, I, here's, here's, my, here's my seal of love to you. I'm, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit of God. Right? So what does that mean? Our state is, in verse 3, it tells us how maturity is displayed. You display maturity by glorying in tribulation. Right? The cross and the crown go together. Grief and glory go together. Right? To glory in tribulation is a real sign of maturity. You won't do that in your flesh. That would take the Holy Spirit working through you, and that's maturity. Right? Then it tells us how maturity is developed in verses 3 to 5. Right. Well, how is it developed? Well, according to verse 3, uh, we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation, what? Worketh patience. It worketh Patience. It didn't say you automatically had patience. It works it out, right? Because when you're in tribulation, I'll give you an example, right? Let's say, let's say you go to the doctor and you have a PET scan done. Now, you do realize if you've ever had a test with the doctor and they'll call you, they'll say, listen, you know, you might have cancer. We're going to run some tests. And you're nervous as a cat in a rocking chair factory and you go sit and they run that stuff through you and they do a PET scan. And then by the time you get home, They've already called you and told you the results, haven't they? No, they haven't. They, they, that may be, well, we'll call you next week, right? I wish it was that way, brother. But it's like, they, well, we'll call you next week. When, and you're going, huh? You're telling me I might have something that could take my life, but you don't, it's not an urgency to you. It's a big deal to me. Right? And you know what you got to do? Got to wait. You call up every day. You, you can let the nurse have it. You can give her a good Christian cussing if you want to. But you ain't getting those results. Right? Then, it, then, it, then you'll put them up on my chart. You don't a bit more than a monkey know what any of that stuff means. And then they might call you a few days later and say, you're good. You know what you had to do, learn to do? Wait. Right. It may not be, and see, here's the thing. It, that waiting, with some people, they go through stuff and they're like, not that big a deal. Other people, it destroys their whole, whole mind. Right. People say, it's not a big deal. It, you, you, it'll be all right. Well, it might be for you, but not for me. 
So maturity is developed by us waiting, by us learning, by us trusting, right? I realize this. Years ago, uh, many of you did not know me then. I, I was sick for six months. I, was, I mean, I, I'd preach Monday morning, Brother Johnny. I felt like I had the flu for six months. I, every, that was my life. Monday, I was sick all the way up till Saturday. I'd try to muster up enough uh, strength to go to preach at church on Sunday. Monday was the same thing. Then I started having pains in my chest, not like heart, but like a sharp pain in my lung right there. So I went to the doctor. They did x ray said, you got a spot there. I said, okay, what's that? He said, Here, this is what I love too. Well, we don't know. It could be an infection. could be cancer. Well, that's a big spectrum, right? Maybe you could say we don't know, not, hey, could be an infection. Could be. So through the next few months, had all these tests run. You know, they figured out. And if I have anything ever, it's something crazy nobody's ever heard of. I, ha I have, and I guess I still got it. I don't guess it's healed. It's called sarcoidosis. And you say, what is that? I have no idea. <laughs> I asked him, I said, how do you get it? We don't know. What is it? Some kind of infection. What I need to do? Well, we don't know. Right? But I was having all these tests run, you know, and to know it could be some kind of infection or could it be cancer. You better learn to wait. I had to learn to wait. Some of you in your life, you, you've had to learn to wait. Tribulation works patience. It works waiting. And the waiting is you realize you can't do anything about it and you're going to have to rely on God. And God gives you the comfort of the Holy Spirit to help you with those things. That's how maturity is developed. You can't just wake up and say, I'm going to have maturity. You've got to go through some stuff to have that maturity developed in your life. And every day we experience something that has the potential to mature us, it could also destroy us. So in those experiences, we develop patience. Well, then finally, in verse 5, he tells us how maturity is determined. Now, I'd, I'd, I'd say this. If I asked you, if I asked for a show of hands, I know we're, we'd lie. If I asked a show of hands, said, how many of you in this auditorium, if I asked you if you are mature, how many of you would say you're mature? Don't raise your hand. I don't want to make liars out of people in cinema. But I'd say, how many of you are mature? Everybody goes, well, I don't want anybody to think I'm immature. Right? Well, who gets to define that? Right. right? Well, I have to let God define for me what maturity looks like. And that's what he's doing here. Because in our life, this is the, this is the whole state of our being. This is how we prove that we are who we say we are. Any, anybody, listen, it's easy. It should be pretty easy if you say you're a Christian to be a Christian in here. At least, for, I mean, a couple hours a week, we come on, we come in, best behavior, act like, love Jesus. But it's out there where you prove it. And that maturity in Christ has to be developed. And when it's, display, it's displayed, he tells us how it's displayed, we glory in tribulation. But then he goes on to tell us how that comes about, how it's developed. Well, we have tribulation, then we have patience, patient experience. Well, then in verse 5, he said, hope maketh us not ashamed. Because, here's the because, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. There's how he determines our maturity. One of God's purposes is to give full assurance to each believer. He wants you to have assurance. He wants you to know you're standing with God. He wants you to know that you have access to God. He wants you to know that God loves you and that he, he'll take care of you. Well, how does he do that? The agent he uses is not the preacher. The agent he uses is not other Christians. The agent that he uses is the Holy Spirit. Think about this. When you get saved, God literally, I hate that word, literally, Puts his spirit in you. Yes, sir. 
It's not a figurative thing. If you're truly born again, you have the very Spirit of God living in you. That's the assurance He gives you. So when, 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 I, when I don't feel like I'm mature, when I don't feel like I can have patience, when I don't feel like I can endure, there's something inside of me. If, I let, if I'm controlled by the Spirit, there's the problem. You gotta, you gotta surrender, submit yourself to the Spirit of God. Right. Let Him have control. Now, all of a sudden, those things that I listen, there's no way Paul could have done what he did without the Spirit of God. Right. So, so the agent is the Holy Spirit. Another of God's purposes is to make us in the into the image of Christ. He wants us to be like Christ and look like Christ and act like Christ. And the way He does that is through tribulation. You don't, you, you, don't, you don't grow and mature until you... Listen, everything that, that grows or gets stronger, there has to be resistance. Right? I mean, you, you lift weights. You say, I'm going to lift weights. Good. You do, you know, curls and you got 10 pounds. You, man, I can do 100 of these. Well, I ain't doing you no good. You do 20. I can do 50 of these. Okay, we'll do 30, right? But it ought to be where at some point in time, that last you're going, right? right? And then if you if you can do, let's say you got 50 pounds and you can do 50 pounds 10 times, and the next time you need to do one or two things. Either you need to do, you know, if you can do 50 pounds 10 times, you need to try to do it 11 or 12 times or add more weight. What's, what are you trying to say? You need more resistance. If things are too easy, you need more resistance. Right. Why? Because muscles get stronger. They, when you lift, they tear. And then when they grow back, they're stronger. But if you keep doing the same thing, you know, I can do five pounds. I'm, whew, I don't want to get too tired. All right, that's all good. You didn't do anything. Right. Right. Same thing spiritually. If you want to get stronger, there's got to be some resistance in your life. Right. An easy Christian life, number one, doesn't happen. Number two, you don't become more like Christ until you have some resistance. And that's where a lot of Christians are. They're afraid to, they're afraid to, to, to fight, face any trials, so they're closet Christians. And so the, God's saying, listen, I'm, I'm going to determine your maturity by how you deal with tribulation. Not how, listen... Probably a better indication, Brother Foy, of someone being controlled by the Spirit of God is not how much they shout, That's right. but how much, they, how much joy they have in tribulation. Yes, that's good. I'll close with this. How mature are you? Well, I'm very mature for my age. <laughs> yeah, right? I feel like I'm... I'm, very, I'm a mature Christian. Well, what are you basing that on? Most of the time we base it on someone who is not a mature Christian. Right? I mean, I came to church today. Good. But that's not Christianity. How, in other words, how closely do you resemble Christ? Well, the only way to more closely resemble him is tribulation. If you're here today, you've never trusted him as your savior. You need to be accepted in the beloved, right? If you're here today and you're a Christian, you say, I'm 100% sure. Now, listen, this not just this not just a fly by the seat of your pants type thing. This not just a passing. Here's what you need to do this morning because I see some of you going, all right, preacher, it's closing time, right? You, you better be sure. Yes. You better be sure. You're right. I was telling Brother Chad, I did his mom's funeral a couple weeks ago. I said, man, you, you, have, you have set off a flurry. You know how many funerals we've been a part of in the last couple weeks? Four, I think. And then Brother Jerry passed away. That's five. That's five people. Just a couple weeks. Every day, you look up the mountains. You think, you th listen. You think people in the mountains thought they were going to get hit by flooding by a hurricane? You don't live in the mountains and expect 
a, a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico to flood you out. Am I right? They don't have no flood insurance up there. You know why? Because they don't expect to be flooded. You think when they went to bed Thursday night and they said storms coming up through here, you think they were like, well, we're, our whole world's not going to be the same after that. No, they went to bed and thought, all right, we're in the mountains. You better be sure. You better be sure this morning. You don't, you don't, you're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised a week. You better be sure that you're accepted in the beloved. But here's, here's the other thing. If you are saved, why is it when tribulation comes you're so blindsided by it? Over and over and over, he tells you it's coming. We go, I can't believe it. It's coming. We're, we're wanting, Brother Bart, we're wanting this thing of serving Christ to be smooth and easy. Doesn't happen. Every situation, watch this, every situation you go through, there, there's two roads. There's one that you can use that situation to honor God. And there's another road that brings reproach on the name of Christ. Everyone. See, the world tell you when you go through tribulation, Brother Dennis, they'll say, well, listen, you're just human. I mean, we had to have sympathy for that because you're just human, and so therefore anybody going through that would react that way. There's the problem. We're not just human. We're supposed to be controlled by the very spirit of a holy God. We're to live above that. We're to be different. We're to react differently. Right? There's a security of salvation. Here's, here's, here's what I, our, our standing with God is secure. Our state of living is ever changing. Now, now you got to determine this morning if you know him as your savior. You can live with the security of knowing you're going to heaven. But the state of the way you live is tribulation. And the Holy Spirit's trying to re refine your character like Jesus Christ in all yeah. those things. I want you to stand with me this morning. I want you to be honest. No one's looking around. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. I want you to be honest and ask yourself two things. Number one, no one's looking around. Every head's bowed. If I died today, this moment, if I, if I never made it out of this Sunday, I drew my last breath, do I know for sure I'd go to heaven? Do you know for sure? I'm not asking if you're a good person, if you've done good things or bad things. I'm saying, do you know for sure where you'd spend eternity? If you don't, here's what I want you to do. By an uplifted hand, I want you to say, Preacher, will you pray for me this morning? It won't save you, but I'd like to pray for you. Would you do it? I don't know for sure, Preacher. Would you pray for me this morning? Is there one? You put your hand up, put it right back down. Is there one? I don't know I'd go to heaven. Thank you. Is there another? Thank you. Is there another? Thank you. Is there another? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just be honest. We're not trying to embarrass you. Thank you. Is there another? Not, not embarrassing you. Just want to pray for you. Let me ask you another question. You that didn't raise your hand, you know for sure you're going to heaven. Praise God for that. How's your walk with God? How's your walk with God? All oh, good. I love I love you. Let me ask you this. All these people raise their hand. Praise God for that. I would think if we were if we were burdened for souls, we'd be on this altar praying for them. I think we would. That's how that's how important this is. Father, I want to thank you for every single precious soul. It was honest enough to slip their hand up and say, Preacher, I don't know for sure. God, that took so much courage. And now in the stillness of this time with people praying for them, will you show them in their heart that you love them and that you want to save them?
Would you give them enough courage maybe to step out of their seat just so we can take the Bible and show them how they can know they're on their way to heaven. I've never embarrassed them for a million years, Father, but they want to know. They, they were honest. There may be some that didn't raise their hand, but in their heart they're not sure where they'd spend eternity. In this time, give them confidence to come out. Father, thank you. Let's keep our heads bowed, eyes closed. If you slipped your hand up or you didn't, again, I won't come to you. I'll not ever embarrass you. But there are people that have their Bible that would love to take it and show you this morning how you can know you're on your way to heaven. But see, you've got to make the step. You've got to step out and say, I want to know. And step out of your seat. And they'll just take you somewhere and show you from the Bible how you can be saved. Would you come? Just right now, would you come? Too important not to come. Would you come? You did a great, courageous thing. Raise your hand. Now, second thing I'm going to ask you, will you come? It's hard, I know. Will you come? Just step out of your seat. Every person here that's saved has been where you're at. I stood right there in the pew. I white-knuckled it until I realized if I don't go right now, if I don't go now, I may not ever have another chance. Today's the day of salvation. That's what your Bible says. Today's the day of salvation. Will you come? 